Greetings comrades, I guess we all can agree that Soviet and Russian cars are just one big meme. You may recall the majestic Volga and Chaika, the strange hunchback to Zaporozhets and the microscopic AK. The Russian car industry has never held back its flight of fancy and has given us such masterpieces as this, this and this. But today we will talk about the car brand which reputation, oddly enough, is quite good. And this reputation abroad is even better than in Russia. Today we will talk about the legendary Lada. How it emerged in the 70s, how it has successfully produced the same car model for over 40 years, how the French saved it from collapsing, and how the same French will ruin it. The first Lada was built in the Soviet Union in 1970 by the Russian car giant called Avtovaz. This car brand spawned thousands of playground jokes, but actually was kinda successful in the end, selling more than 25 million cars worldwide. So let's start as usual, with a minute of history. How the idea of people's car in the USSR was born, how this brand lived and thrived, and how it gradually found itself on the brink of oblivion. One day, in the mid-1960s, the Soviet government realized that it was falling terribly behind its western counterparts in terms of car production. Sure, there was the Moskvich, there was the Volga for government officials, but it was clearly not enough. Therefore, to reduce this gap, it was decided to build a huge automotive plant, which was to focus on the creation of passenger cars for Soviet citizens. But the US authorities understood perfectly well that the country had no experience in this field, and therefore it was looking for foreign partners for this business. Among the options were Renault, Peugeot or even Volkswagen. Then the first ladders could end up looking like this, or even this. No, God, please, no! Fiat ended up being the partner, and already in 1966, in the city with the beautiful Italian name of Tagliati, the Avtovaz plant was built. By the way, before 1964 the city was called Stavropol, so the very renaming of the city was a kind of a gift to the Italian partners. Four years later, the first model of the concern, the now legendary Lada Capeca, came off the assembly line. Not surprisingly, it was similar to the Fiat 124, like two piece in a port. In fact, it was Fiat, but adapted to the harsher conditions of Russia, reinforced structure, high clearance and some added stability at sub-zero temperatures. At the same time, it is worth mentioning that Fiat itself at that time was considered quite archaic by European standards. Longitudinal engine, real wheel drive and beam axle. But the USSR decided that it would suit them best. At the same time, in 1969, Italians had already presented Fiat 128 with front wheel drive to the public. And the Capeca remained forever with the rear wheel. Moreover, Soviet representatives have seen a prototype of experimental car during their visit to Italy. When Soviets asked their questions about what is it, Italians lied that it was some unsuccessful experiment and front-wheel drive cars have no future. <laughs> the whole essence of the first Lada models was in their maximum simplicity and reliability, after all the car was made for the common people. By the way, in Soviet times these cars were called Zhiguli and the name Lada was given to the same models produced for export. It was hard for foreigners to pronounce Zhiguli correctly. After the first model came the Vaz 2102 and 2103, which was considered a luxury version of the Kapeika. After Vaz was trying to expand its model range, but let's be honest, all versions of this car from 2101 to 2109 were not very different from each other. That's why this meme was born. But there was one model that stood out, the Lada Niva. This SUV is an absolute unique model because it was first released back in 1977, and it is still in production and is popular, with minimal changes. The best qualities of Lada turned out to be the most suitable exactly for SUV. It has good cross-country ability and reliability, all-wheel drive, and its simplicity made it possible to fix it with the guys in the garage on Saturdays. What else do you need to be happy? Maybe only a floating modification of Niva, or a pickup truck. Just kidding, they never became popular. Some researchers consider the Niva to be a direct ancestor of the whole compact crossover class. They say Niva was the inspiration for the creators of the Suzuki Viterra. Some experts call it the best car in the history of Avtovaz, and it is the most successful expo model of brand throughout its history. It was the only Russian car that was actually exported to Japan even. 
they can still find Nevis in places like South America or Australia, as their owners don't want to abandon this immortal classic. But if you think that buying a ladder was something simple for a Soviet man, you are sorely mistaken. You think, oh, it's people's car, so everyone could afford it, right? For example, Lada Kopeika cost 5,620 Soviet rubles in 1975. In today's money it's about 1.5 million rubles, the price of something like Škoda Octavia. The average monthly salary of an engineer in the same year was about 180 to 200 rubles. Accordingly, an average Soviet family had to save for a few years to buy such a car, depriving itself of a lot of things. What did buying a car look like in the planned economy? It was a very exciting quest. Let's say you had the right amount of money saved up. You go to the store and buy a ladder? Yeah, no. You go to the local committee of a trade union organization and say you want to buy a car. They check your background thoroughly, god forbid you were involved in something that disgraced a Soviet citizen, and put you on a waiting list. You wait in this queue for a few months, maybe even a few years, and only then do you get the right to buy a car. Oh, you were not ready, already spent some of the money. Sorry, next. Of course. For famous people, ballerinas, cosmonauts, athletes, Politburo members, there were separate money and separate stores. Do you have Nespasil Torque checks? Then there is a separate store for you, where there is no shortage. How was that? All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Of course, there was also a market for used cars. But they were sometimes even more expensive than new ones, simply because you didn't have to wait for years for your turn. But let's go back to the present. So the USSR collapsed, which meant tough times for its people's car, especially for export. Judge for yourself, back in the 1990s there were about 130,000 Russian-built ladders registered to drive on British roads. Between 1994 and 2005, just over 10 years, the number of licensed ladders fell from more than 134,000 to less than 3,000. In Russia the picture, of course, was not so depressing, but still not the most cheerful. In short, in the 90s the common people in Russia had no money. And those who had them, they didn't need a trivial ladder, they wanted to drive a black BMW or Mercedes. In fact, all through the 90s Avtovaz was fighting with organized crime. Naturally, such a huge plant was a tidbit for all the organized crime groups in Russia. Everyone wanted to protect them. By the mid-1990s, the majority of the car sales were going through the hands of criminal structures. The factory worked non-stop, but the entire profits ended up in the pockets of those gangsters. So there was no modernization to speak of. In the end, due to the difficult criminal situation in the city in the 90s, it was decided to just transfer the plant to the new federal owners. Since 2005, the main control of the plant went to Ross Abaron Export. However, this didn't help either. Things at Lada were getting worse and worse, and by 2009 they were on the verge of bankruptcy. The factory was even partially shut down. It became clear that the plant was not able to overcome the crisis by itself, and the only chance for the company was to sell it to the foreign partner. And the partner was found once again. It was the French from Renault, who already owned 25% of Avtovaz shares by that time. In 2013, Bo Anderson took over the director's position, under whom Lada experienced probably the best creative period in its recent history. In 2015, the production of two new Lada models, the Vesta and the X-Ray, began. And let's be honest, the Lada Vesta is probably the only Lada model that is actually really competitive. And it's not just because of the low price. They truly managed to put together a pretty good car under the direction of the French, and the car was built on a 100% Russian platform. It would seem that here it is, a revival, but no. Despite the success of the models themselves, Avtovaz was never able to break even, and in 2016 Anderson stepped down as director. In particular, the owners of Avtovaz were dissatisfied with the active use of foreign components in the creation of the car, and called it a big mistake. If you ask me, that was just the thing that could have saved Lada. After all, its most important problem has always been the low quality of the components. The truly disgusting quality of components. Yes, because they were of poor quality, it was really easy to replace them, it was very cheap to repair. But sometimes this repair was something you had to be doing every week. In general, by the 20s of the 21st century, the future of Lada on the European arena was as vague as possible. To put it mildly. 
they had their time to shine, but now Lada's sun has set. For the night is dark and full of terrors. In Europe they have not been popular for a long time, because they were a mixture of retro design, even if they were new, and simple off-road technology. In Russia their sales were significantly cut by Hyundai Kia Group, that offered much high quality cars for the same price. In the end, the Renault Nissan management announced what they were planning to do with Aftavas. Unfortunately for all the admirers, the news are quite sad. The brand will be completely unified with Dacia cars, and new cars will be produced only on Renault platforms. La Dacia, Dada, Lacha. After us, will not present any completely new models on 2021 and 2022. In 2023 and 24, they are planning to make three compact B class cars under the Lada brand, already on a foreign platform. Thus, the Russian platforms for the Vesta, Grand and Niva SUVs will not be developed anymore. The last representatives of true Russian cars will disappear from the stores. Yes, it is possible that formerly Lada branded cars will still drive on the roads of Russia. But they will be just some disguised Frenchmen pretending to be Russian. They will no longer have that very Russian soul, for which some people have loved the cars of this brand so much.